All right, thank you. Hello, everyone. So I'm going to make some music with Angular 2. So it's really a talk about the combination between of two things, web development and music, which are both kind of great passions of mine. And, and I'm sure the same is true for many of us here. But I don't think it's quite that common to actually try to combine these two things. And uh, it certainly hasn't been the case for me until very recently. But I've started to get into exploring this curious intersection this year. And I think there are a couple of reasons why this has started to happen for me now. And uh, the main one is really a really simple technical reason, and that's web audio. So with the web audio being deployed, deployed across all the major browsers now, we have a way to make music, uh, to process and synthesize audio in the browser. And uh, as a web developer, that really suits me because Although programming environments for music have existed for longer than I have existed, um, it's never really been quite that connected to the stuff I do anyway every day because I spend a lot of energy trying to keep up with the web platform. So this kind of brings musical programming to my world. But the, the other reason I've been starting to do this is more personal than that. And that's really my growing fascination you could see, say, even obsession at this point with generative music. So by this, I mean this uh, tradition of making music, not by composing it or by performing it, but by constructing systems that then make the music for you. And uh, there's a long history of these kinds of things in the world. Humans have been building wind chimes for thousands of years. There's a long tradition of uh, different kinds of experimental musical systems, and coming back to the present, there's a lot of procedural and algorithmic music done in, in games these days, for example. And this is like, for me, a fascinating thing because uh, it lends itself to software really well. And that, that works for me because I'm, I'm a programmer, but I'm not a musician, so I don't actually play anything, but I do build systems for a living. So I don't make music, but I do make systems. So the leap I'm taking here is really what if I could make systems that make music? Like that seems to me to be a great way for me to enter this world of, of musical expression as someone who's not a musician. So that's what I've been trying to do, and I've been using web audio to do that. And today I have this one particular system that I would like to discuss, which originates with Terry Riley, the American composer, who's kind of one of the leading figures of Western classical music in the second half of the 20th century. He's done a lot of things in the last decades, but there's this one particular piece that's interesting to me as a generative system as well. It's called NC. He did that when he was really young in the early 60s. So it's a piece of classical music. It's a, it has a score and everything, so it's a proper you know, classical piece, but it's a very unusual one in the sense that it actually only contains one page of mu music notation. And on that page, there are these 53 numbered tiny patterns of melodies. So not much musical material at all. But even though there's not much in there, when you perform this, you get usually more than an hour of music. And the way that works is that you can play this with ensembles of any sizes, with any instruments. But there are a couple of rules. One is that every player needs to perform the same 53 patterns in the same order, in the same sequence, starting from number one ending up in number 53. But these performers also have this uh, freedom to stay repeating each pattern as long as they want. So you can keep repeating a single pattern for as long as you feel like it. And that is the generative element in this piece of music. So if we consider just two players playing this, they're both going to start in pattern one, because that's kind of one of the rules. But there's going to come a time when one of those players makes a decision to jump onto pattern two, while the other one play stays in one. And suddenly we have two things playing at the same time, which wasn't written down anywhere, but the results from this decision made by this individual player. And then some, at some point, the other player might also jump onto pattern two. But since these patterns also have differing durations, even though they're on the same pattern now, they might not be playing in unison anymore. So
So here we see from these really simple rules and this very simple musical material, we get this complexity that emerges from these decisions made by these people at runtime. And that's kind of, that kind of gets more and more complex when you add more players to the ensemble and when you get deeper into the score. So one way to look at that is, is that it's not really just one composition. It's this whole landscape of possible compositions that uh, generate a new kind of concrete piece of music every time you play it, which no one has ever heard before. So even though this has been performed for thousands of times in the last 52 years, there's never been two performances for exactly the same uh, composition. And to me, as someone who's not musically educated, this is just weird that something like that can even exist. Like, how can there be something with so much freedom built into it? But still, if you listen to 20 different versions on YouTube, you can still recognize each one as this composition. So that's just a mystery to me that that even exists. But the other thing about that is that I can look at this score and I can look at the instructions and say, well, that's actually a system. There's an algorithm underlying this whole thing. And that's something I can explore as a programmer. So what I did is I took that uh, notation and I translated it into a JSON file, which would let me then work with that using software. And then I built this little application on top of that, which would let me play the piece. So this is a web app that runs in your browser that plays this composition for you, which you can use to, to, for your own entertainment or education. And you're accompanied there by these five bot performers who play the music for you, each one contributing their own instrument. But as a user, you get to conduct them. So you get to choose when each one uh, joins the music. And then you can also choose when each one moves on to the next pattern because they're always going to keep repeating the same thing until you push them over to the next pattern. your way through the composition with a path that no one has ever heard before. And as you do that, you get into these very different places because there are kind of different movements built into the piece. And they might be constructed of extremely simple musical material, but it gets more complex when these bots arrive at it at different times and they layer on top of each other in unexpected ways. That's how that works. So that's a web app that runs in your browser that uses the web audio API to play the sounds and some kind of a stuff to, to make the visualization. And it is an Angular application, so it's written with Angular and NGRX in this sort of reactive style. And here's how it works. So at the center of this whole architecture, we have really the most important thing, which is the state of the application. That's a single data structure that completely describes what's going on in the app. So who's playing it? What are they playing right now? What are they going to play next? It's all going to be in that single data structure. And that's an immutable data structure, which means that we never change it. Instead, what we do when things happen is we use a function called a reducer to make new versions of that state. So that takes two arguments, the current state, and an action that represents something that just happened in the world, and then it uses those to produce a new state. And that's a pure function that just returns another state. Uh, without mutating the original one. And as we apply this reducer many times over, as time goes by, we get this timeline of successive state values. And that's actually something that can easily be thought of as an observable. So we have this timeline of state, which takes on different values as time goes by, and observables are a great way to model something like that. And if we take that observable and package it together with the reducer function that operates on it, we get something called a star. So this is the NGRX store pattern. It's the combination 
of the application state as an observable with the reducer function that works on it. And we can dispatch actions to it, and it will apply those actions to the state using the reducer, and then emit those values on the observable. So that's the kind of core NGRX store pattern that we have here. Very similar to Redux as well, uh, for example. But that's still just kind of the functional core of the app. It doesn't do anything. It's dormant until we connect it to the outside world in various ways. And uh, the connection where everything springs from in this application is something called a pulse. So in the score of NC, it says that the piece should be performed so that there's always one player playing these high C notes on a piano with a steady tempo. And that provides, that continues throughout the whole performance, and it provides this rhythmic grid for everyone else to play against. And we have that pulse in the application as well. You can hear it when you play it. But more importantly, I actually use it to, to drive the rest of the music as well. So I have this little service inside the application that contains a metronome that produces ticks at a steady time interval. And that's an observable of ticks which I map onto pulse actions. And then I use the NGRX effects library, which has this effect decorator, to um, feed those actions into the store. So I'm effectively producing this steady stream of pulse actions that go into the store, where the store then reacts accordingly by producing new application states. Because it has an action handler inside it for the pulse action. And there we do decisions like uh, what notes everyone's going to play right now, should some of the players repeat the current pattern, move on to the next. So we're really just sequencing the music live as a reaction to this pulse uh, as, it, as it comes in. And uh, that kind of composes the music. But the music is still going to be a pure data structure, and we can't listen to data, so we need something more to make it audible as well. And that something in this application is another service called an audio player. So this one also has an NGRX effect in it, but that's a bit different in the sense that it doesn't actually dispatch anything to the store. Instead, it reacts to actions dispatched by someone else. For, so for every pulse, it's going to react by taking the latest state from that store, which is an observable, and then it plays whatever sounds should be played based on that state. And this is a fairly simple service. It doesn't make any decisions about what to play or when to play. It just you, it handles the web audio implementation details of playing these notes at specific times. But the actual composition of the music is made in the reducer instead. This is a fairly dumb output sort of pipe for that music. But it's modeled like this as a an, as an side effect of the store. So now we have one input effect, one output effect uh, put together using observables. And when we put, do that, we get this thing that you can actually listen to. But there's still one thing missing from this, which is then everything you see on the screen, the UI. And that part is, well, unsurprisingly implemented as an Angular component tree. So the way it works is that there is this root component in the application, as there usually is, into which we inject that store that we have. And then we use the NGRX select operator to select parts of the state observable that are interesting to us in terms of the visualization. So we get observables of those parts of the state. And then in the components template, we use the async pipe to subscribe to those observables. So we're effectively subscribing to the store. So whenever there are new states, uh, potentially, for example, after every one of those pulses, new data may flow into the Angular component UI through these subscriptions here. And then there's a bunch of other components in that UI, but they are all so-called stateless, dumb, uh, however you want to call them, uh, pure components that don't know anything about stores or observables or, or actions. They just get what they need as pure data structures using the com component inputs, so the Angular component data flow. So when we then turn that around, when the user actually does something, when they click on one of those buttons, we get events that we then propagate back up the component tree in the opposite direction from the inputs. So we get events that then go up, reach the root component, and there we dispatch an action to the store. So, so this, ha this is how the root component ends up having a bidirectional relationship with the store. It not only subscribes to it, but also dispatches actions back to it. But the rest of the components know nothing about this. They just use inputs and outputs. And that pretty much completes the picture. That's how the architecture of this application is, is constructed. 
and I'm quite confident that that's actually a pretty solid set of primitives for any musical Angular app because you need something to model time, you need something for your core logic for sequencing, comp composing the music, something to make it audible, and something to make it visible and to control it. And uh, it's been working pretty well here, and it's really these really decoupled things that are communicating through observables. So I think that connects to what, what Rob was saying yesterday about using observables to compose applications. These things know nothing about each other. I'm just, they're just plumbed together using these observable flows. And it's been, been pretty, pretty nice to work with. But there are also actually a couple of interesting developer productivity related things that this architecture makes pretty easy that I would like to mention as well. One of them is hot loading. So I have a setup in this project where I can make changes to the code while the application is running and have those applied without having to start from the beginning, which is pretty important when I'm like 20 minutes into the music, for example, if I want to change how it looks, I don't have to find my way back to where I was earlier, which is what would happen if there was a page reload. And this is something I can do even though Angular itself doesn't really support hot loading at the moment. There's no like official thing for hot loading there. But I can do that, I can easily roll my own because of how this architecture works. And that's to do with how this state is modeled here. And the ma main thing to understand is that that state really describes everything about, everything you need to know about that application at any given time. So that means when, when Webpack tells me that the code has changed, you get this hot module replacement event that says we're gonna have to reload now. All I have to do is pick the state from that running application from, in, from inside the store and keep it while the application reloads. And then I get the new application with the new code, I drop in that state to the new application, and what immediately happens is that the same music starts playing, the same visual starts rendering, because they're both just derived from the state. So I'm kind of cheating. It's, this is not actually hot loading. You know, I'm not replacing the code inside the running application. I'm reloading the whole thing. But I don't really notice as I'm developing this because I get back to exactly where I was. And I can just continue working. So that's a pretty like, neat workaround for the lack of like, official hot loading. And you can do that when you do it this way. And that's actually pretty important when you're working on an application like this because you might have a hundred different ideas, at least I do, most of which are going to be you know, terrible ideas, but you don't know which ones are good and which ones are bad until you try them out. So you need these feedback loops to guide you through the whole process of figuring out what makes sense and what doesn't. And hot loading can provide one of those feedback loops. And it was really useful when, when doing this. But it's also useful for any application development because we're always doing creative problem solving as we do application development and we need this, this feedback from the app to tell us if we're going in the right direction and hot loading can do that. And, and we can do that today with Angular with these kind of special circumstances at least. So that's one developer tool I have in there. There's another one which I use not quite as often, but it can be pretty useful when, when I do need it. And that's this little slider component I have at the lower edge of the screen in developer mode, which uh, lets me travel through time. So, so I can at any point grab that slider and drag it back into the past to something that was there half an hour ago or something. Or then I can drag it back into the future again. And that ends up being very useful when I say make a change to the visualization and I want to see how that affects different parts of the composition because it might be very different and I really don't want to click my way through the whole thing every time. So that's been very useful and it's also just fun to play with, maybe a little bit too fun. But that also just falls out of this architecture. That's the nice thing about that because it's again about that state. Because another thing about that state is that it's an immutable data structure, which means that we don't change it. When we make new versions of it using the reducer, we're not destroying the previous versions. And that means we can instruct the NGRX developer tools to keep the old states around as we, as we develop. We can keep a whole history of the application states in memory during development, and then we can flick through it essentially. We can kind of go back to the past, you know, take any historical state and reuse it as the current state. And because of how this works, the um, music and visuals start then generating from that state. 
So something neat that you can just do quite easily with this kind of architecture. But so at this point, I'm more or less done with the project though. Uh, there are some extensions still going, but it's, it's, it's uh, more or less finished. But one, one thing that happened that I would like to mention because it was really cool was when I tweeted about that project when I was still in the middle of it a few weeks ago, this guy Christian happened to see that tweet and he works in IoT. He has a lab in Amsterdam with some physical lights, lights in it. And he had this idea of maybe we could put this thing together. So we did that. We hooked up my Angular application with the lights in his lab. And uh, this is just something I never expected to do in my life, which is to make a light installation based on a classical composition by Terry Riley. But, but these things seem to happen. Uh, and um, it was a really cool, cool thing to, to be able to do. And we're working on maybe doing more things to get it integrated with, with their IoT network mesh to maybe make it uh, controlled by buses going around Amsterdam because they have data about that. And let's see where we are going. But what's really neat about that from our conversation's perspective is that adding that integration was a matter of simply adding one more NGRX effect to the project. So I didn't make any changes to the core logic, no changes anywhere else, just one more output effect. And that I often use like a measure for how well an architecture is working out for me. Like when I want to do something new with it, can I, do I have to massage all the existing code around that to make it work? Or can I just add new things and replace them? And in this case, I, I was really happy to see that it was really easy. And uh, I think it kind of is a result of this, this decoupled architecture because these things really are, don't know anything about each other. They don't care where, what's behind those observables, where, where those things come from, where they go. So I can replace things, add new things, uh, remove things with the rest of it kind of staying intact. So I'm pretty optimistic about what I can do with this application and these kinds of architectures in general. But yeah, so that's the application. And if you want to play with it, I have it online. There's a URL there you can open in any modern web audio capable web browser, which is at this point pretty much anything but IE. And you can play it for yourself. You can play that uh, music and uh, yeah, just see how it feels. Or if you want to hack on the code, that's on GitHub. I have a project on there, which is just a regular Webpack Angular project. So you can just clone it and start hacking. And that's me. Thank you. <laughs>